Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, NAPOD. NAPOD features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for NAPOD, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to NAPOD.XYZ if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. Pleasure to introduce uh, someone who I just met. She braved the elements to come all the way out here from Waco, Texas. Let's give a big California welcome to Ann Kay. Thanks, group. My name is Ann Kay from Waco, Texas. And <laughs> as tradition in my home group, I'll give you my sobriety date. It's January 27, 1974. Um, I'd like to start out by first thanking the committee for inviting me to California. It gave me an opportunity to uh, come down a little bit early and and spend some time with Harriet and go back to San Francisco, which I haven't seen since I was three months sober. And I was so excited when I got the phone call to come down and and was invited. And and I guess I need to say thank you to uh, Ash Tree Fellowship Tapes. They're the people that are taping the conference this weekend because it's the lady behind the table over there that did all the searching to find my phone number. It was so incredible. I couldn't wait to get here to find out how y'all got my number. Um, First of all, my name has changed a number of times since I've been in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I didn't uh, get well real quick. And um, it's been the same name now for the last six years, but um, it changed a few times before that. And uh, I moved around quite a bit. I've, I've gotten to where at least my sponsor told me one time that um, he knew I'd get well when I that I was well when I quit picking my finger, uh, quit picking my nose. This doesn't ever get any easier, y'all. My knees are shaking. <sighs> he knew I'd be well when I quit picking my nose and I had my name and phone number and the correct address in the telephone book. And uh, I guess I'm not well yet because my name's not right in the phone book yet. And um, um, I'm supposed to tell you all what happened to me out there and what it's like now. And and, um, when I do that, it's real hard for me. I was telling Harriet earlier this evening in the room, I've been sober for a few years now. And um, it's real scary for me. I get real frightened standing up here. because I'm emotional. I'm a titty baby. I cry. And a lot of things have happened to me since I've been sober in this program. And I owe everything that I am today to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I was beaten and broken when I came to the program. I was 18 years old. And um, I came right off the streets of North Houston, which isn't a real nice neighborhood. And um, I wasn't a real nice person. I didn't know anything about the world except shooting dope and drinking. I was a wino. And um, one of my most favorite people in the whole world that celebrated my birthday with me for 15 years, uh, Knox W., who died two years ago now, with 35 some odd years of sobriety, 38, something like that. He was always called the wino in Houston. And um, he used to introduce me because I was right behind him always. And um, he used to introduce me as his little winette. And um, <laughs> you know, it's a hell of a way to be known around the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. But anyway... Um, when I tell my story, I always uh, 
in the beginning, it always sounds more like I'm telling my parents' story. And I guess if I have a message tonight, I have a message for those of you who have lost people in your family, and I might have a message for a few of the parents. Um, I wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, not because y'all kept me sober, but because you kept my father sober and you kept my mom sane. Um, I came from, quote, unquote, what's called a dysfunctional family today. Where I came from, it was just called fucked up. Um, you know, my parents really did the very best they knew how to do. You know, I don't hate my parents. I didn't hate my parents when I went into treatment. Um, my father was an alcoholic and my mother was just crazy. And, um, Al-Anon didn't do a whole lot for her. But at any rate, um, I grew up in the tight, I was one of five children. Well, actually one of four. My parents adopted a boy when I was 16 years old. To make a real long story short, my older brother was killed. Uh, in an automobile accident when I was 13 years old. And I was a member of this program without joining this program a long time before I ever came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I had all the isms of alcohol long before I came here. Um, I suffered from the things that I suffer from today. I suffered from those things from the age, earliest age back as I can remember, inferiority, superiority, uh, fear, anger, anxiety, and all of those things. Um, My older brother, by the time I turned 13 years old, my older brother was the only link to reality that I had. Um, that movie that's so popular on TV that they show about once a year, The Teenage Alcoholic, is a classic story of Ann B. You know. Um, I hid my bottles underneath the seat of my car. My dad was a car deal, used car salesman, and I always had a car. So, therefore, I was always surrounded by people. I was never lonely, you know. I was never lonely. Uh, in that sense of the word, I was always surrounded by people because I was the only kid at 13 that had a car. And, um, you know, I, I uh, the, the sad part about all of that was is that I could have 50 people around me and still be alone. I never felt like I fit in anywhere. And uh, I needed all of those things that I had around me in order to keep those people around me so that I didn't have to stop and take a look at what I was doing to myself. I knew from the first drink what I was doing to myself. Um, what happened in the summer of my 13th year was my older brother was killed in an automobile accident. And I believe after all the years that I've had to look back over my life and put things in order today, that that, that was the severing point for me. That was the point where I shut off from the rest of the world. That's the point where I tuned in and dropped out. That was in 1963 somewhere thereabouts. Y'all are going to figure this out. I'm really bad with times, dates, you know, and all that. I think at Icky Pie, I gave the wrong sobriety date and used the wrong name at the next one, but, you know, just try to piece the pieces together. I get started on a story, too, and forget where I'm at and just go on to something else. But um, anyway, <clears throat> when my brother killed, it severed all my ties to reality. I absolutely tuned in and dropped out. Um, that was during the Timothy O'Leary and, uh, you know, dropping acid days. A lot of this, my story is going to be before y'all. By the way, I'm 35 years old. Um, <clears throat> what happened was I just stayed blottoed for as long a period of time as I could. That happened to be at the time in history, in medical history, when um, heart surgery and heart transplant was brand new to the world. And my family was catapulted into the news. We were in the papers and on TV, and, and there were news people around our house all the time because my brother was in perfect health condition. He founded a surf club called the Southern Association Surf Club. And he was just, you know, beautiful physique, beautiful man. And uh, he was killed in an automobile accident, and the van rolled over and smashed his head. So the rest of his body was all right, and my folks donated his heart. And a man received his heart, and as a result of that, we got a lot of public press and, you know, TV and all that kind of stuff because it was brand new. And I was real frightened by all of that. I'm not the life of a party, you know. Uh, by nature, I'm, I'm shy. I'm frightened by people. And alcohol brought all of that, made me the other person. It made me the person that I wanted to be. 
um, when my brother died, my my relationship with my mother was always awful. I can't remember when it was ever good. Um, as a result of my father's alcoholism, all of the and my mother working all the time, all of the stress of raising a family and and feeding and washing clothes and you know so on and so forth was put on my shoulders. I was the oldest daughter. And I raised my little brother and my little sister and my, my older brother. It was my job to see to it that he got breakfast and dinner and and uh, got off to work and he had school clothes to wear to school the next day. Um, when he died, I had nobody left in this world to talk to. And I went completely inside of myself. Um, all the way through high school, I was known as Sunshine. Until I was five years sober, my father called me Sunshine. And he thought it was a term of endearment. And when I was five years sober, I finally had the uh, guts to ask my father to please not call me Sunshine anymore, that the reason the kids always called for Sunshine is because I was the Sunshine Connect, the Orange Sunshine Connection at school. And um, that was the way that deal went, you know. And uh, I don't remember. I, I have such respect and admiration for the kids that are I see in the program I say kids lightly I don't mean it that way the the young people that are in the program today I couldn't get laid the first time without being stoned and high I didn't go to the senior prom sober and clean I didn't go through exams sober and clean I didn't deal with my first job interview sober and clean you know I couldn't deal with reality on reality's terms I couldn't deal with the world on the world's terms the Vietnam War was real, you know, big right then. It was going on. And, uh, you know, we knew we were all going to die tomorrow. So we were getting all the gusto we could from today. And, you know, and I went through a whole lot of years, seven to be exact, of doing that. Um, I don't believe that the disease of alcoholism is hereditary. I believe that the symptoms are hereditary. The characteristics of alcoholism are hereditary. What I her- uh hereditary. <laughs> What I inherited from my father was that inability to deal with what was going on in today's world, you know, to deal with those fears, to deal with that insecurity, to deal with that that uh, superiority. Um, and I drank to be equal to the people around me. I was never equal to anybody. I was either way down here or way up here. Um I managed to get through high school. I had pretty typical high school years. I never got caught. Um, I got expelled from school for causing a riot at school. Uh, we had a peace march. And um, my, the problem was that both my parents taught school. And um, <clears throat> in my senior year, um, some of you may remember when William Calley, who during the Vietnam War, he was a colonel, I think, in the service at any rate, uh, he was placed under house arrest for a... Uh, uh, particular coup that went on in in Vietnam and they were just passing the buck and I was really into politics at that time in my life everybody was but uh I decided to write my senior thesis on the injustice of justice you know isn't that bizarre we think of bizarre things on acid and uh (laughs) anyway so I decided to write this thesis on what they did to him and we got extra points for doing things like class participation, any props that we happened to use, and so on and so forth. So I thought it'd be really cool if everybody were in my class. Now, this was just for the senior history class. If everybody in the class wore these black armbands, and I brought 20 or 30, how many ever kids we had in class that time, um, this black armband to wear in class. And you know how, have you ever told a secret in AA? In the, at say the noon meeting and by the time you got to the 10 o'clock candlelight meeting you heard the secret that you told at noon that same stuff happens in high school and that's what happened and see I lived in a really backward small farming community called Aldine, Texas and in Aldine we didn't have black people in our high school uh, we d- we didn't have bangs you know that's when everybody was surfing and the beach boys were really big and the girls painted those little curls on their eyes and uh, you know the girls counselor go down the hall like this licking and wiping them off and they used to set us up on the stage and measure our dresses and if they were more than an inch above our knee we were sent home and I was sent home pretty regular I'd get to school and roll my skirt up I couldn't leave the house like that because my mom wouldn't allow it 
at any rate, I wrote this thesis, you see, and I thought it'd be really cool to have everybody wear these armbands, and so I brought enough for my class, and by the time gym class was over, everybody had taken their socks and tied their socks around, their gym socks around their arm, and I set it up so that when the, we were all the senior class was in the auditorium, and I was going to be up there telling my deal, and my little class was, the whole senior class was in there, and my class was right here, and they were going to hum something like the Star Spangled Banner while I read my thesis. You know, I mean, I was so dramatic. And um, I can't imagine why. Sometimes Boone's Farm and Acid will do that to you. But, you know, I, I just thought that would be the thing to do. And I knew I was going to ace this test. I was good in history anyway. It wasn't my I needed to do something like that in math. I can't add and subtract. But at any rate, I did this deal. And as an added effect, I thought it would be really to my benefit if I called one of the TV stations. And I did. I called Channel 2. And they were always real cooperative in our school system and because I was well known or my name was well known in the community because of my brother they were kind of interested in a success story here's this girl you know her brother dies and her parent you know they really did it good and they came out and the problem was you see I was already playing pharmacist when this took place in my senior year, and some of you may relate to this, I'd get up in the morning and take speed, smoke dope at 10 o'clock at the first break so I could come down because I'd be too high from the speed. I knew I was going to get busted. Bear in mind now that both my parents taught school there. And then, you know, the dope would make me too giggly and wild, so at lunch I'd go out and drink a bottle of Strawberry Hill wine, go back into school, and the wine always made me sick, so I'd take something for the upset stomach, and, you know, I mean, this is the way my day went. You know, I mean, I was like a walk-in pharmacy. And uh, I always considered myself or called myself a trash can junkie because I didn't care what it was, uppers, downers, booze, pot. You know, it didn't matter. It, it, if it altered the way I felt, then that's what I did. And um, so, anyway, I had made my little trip to the parking lot, and I'd made my little trip to the locker, and I was on my way to the gym because history, see, is like at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Well, <laughs> when the bells rang, my class was going to stand up and quietly, in protest, walk out the door of the auditorium and go sit underneath the flag. And we were going to lower the flag in honor of William Kelly. Well, we did not know that it's a federal law that you don't screw around with an American flag, first of all. And number two... I had also reached that point in that line had already been crossed that the big book talks about, about not being able to predict our actions when we drink. And, you know, the acid was supposed to take place at 10.05, you know. And what happened was it didn't hit me until 2.04 when I was standing behind that podium. And, you know... The bells rang, and the kids walked out the back, and not only did the 22 people that were sitting on the second row get up and walk out, the whole goddamn school walked out, and the bells from the hallways, the freshman class, the sophomore class, and everybody was outside. And, you know, our people were good, hardcore. What we did on Friday and Saturday night in our neighborhood is we went to the American Legion Hall. Those people did not like the fact that we had a riot at our school. And that we were, you know, doing that kind of thing. They weren't happy at all. So we go out the door, and, I mean, you know, how many of you have ever been given a dare? You know, I mean, I couldn't w wuss out on them. They were depending on me, right? And I was plenty stoned, and I crawled up that flagpole because they told me to do it. And I was standing on that flagpole reading my thesis, and I was having a great time. Now, uh... Did any of you guys see that movie that Joan Crawford did, Mommy Dearest? Is it Joan Crawford? Okay. You know when she got after that kid with that thing? My mother came out of that school. <laughs> when I saw that movie, I thought, God, it looked like my mother when she came after me and they jerked me off that flagpole. <laughs> well, they didn't get any of the other kids in trouble, but the entire, Mr. Richardson's entire history class was expelled three days before finals. I was the only one that didn't get to take my final. Well, y'all know that when we're full of those kind of chemicals, we're not gutless wonders. And I wasn't going to let well enough alone. 
I didn't think they had a right to infringe upon my civil rights of freedom of speech. I knew the history books. You know, it's not, I mean, I, they, they, my parents were paying for my education. So I went to the school board meeting and I explained to them that they didn't have a right, that they were infringing upon my, my, my civil rights. I had a right to stand up behind that podium and tell those kids what was going on in Vietnam because we were all fixing to go to Vietnam and die. And I believed that. Well, I got back into school and everything worked out okay. I graduated from high school, married with a child. Uh, they didn't know I was married and they didn't know I had a child. It wasn't cool to be pregnant then in a teenager. Now it's, you know, it's not looked down upon. It was really bad then. And we lived in a tent in my parents' backyard, and that was real neat because all the hippies did that, you know. <clears throat> uh, you know, and that's just the kind of childhood I had. I didn't get busted. I don't know why. It just wasn't my turn, you know. Um, I had every reason to be. I just never did. Um, I got in trouble and went to jail a couple of times, but it was just lightweight stuff, and that was pretty much the end of it. My number didn't come up. You know, my number didn't come up. Um, after I got out of high school, I didn't graduate from high school with my class because I got to showing a little bit. You know, I was on the swim team, and um, it, w it became real apparent that I was pregnant, and my mom and dad thought it might be cool if I'd go downtown to this school for pregnant girls, and so that's what I did. And... Uh, I didn't like it over there, and by the way, I was married anyway, so what the hell did they didn't have any right to tell me what I had to do, so I just quit. I quit school. And I went to work, and, and uh, you know, the baby was born, and reality was there, and, and I cleaned up for a little while. She was a beautiful little eight-and-a-half-pound bouncing baby girl, you know, with all these little blonde curls, and I just thought she was a neat little Barbie doll, you know. I mean, it was really neat. Here we are. We got a little house. We got little dishes, and we got little vacuum cleaners, and, you know, little brown paper bags, and we go off to school, and... You know, but that was real good for, oh, two, three, maybe five days, you know. After that, <laughs> it wasn't fun anymore, and I couldn't put that baby back where it came from, and I couldn't make that man that I didn't like go away. You know, he, he came home from work hungry, and he wanted clean clothes, and he expected me to wash them and me to cook. And it really, I couldn't go to the concerts where I wanted to be with all my friends. He didn't like me smoking dope all day long and drinking. And uh, the baby cried and woke me up at night, and, and, you know, she messed up a good high several times, and it, I didn't appreciate it. But I couldn't do nothing about my situation except get more and more deep into what was going on in my life. And, and uh, so that's what I did. And I went from that into some harder drugs and drinking on top of it and just continued to go straight downhill. And I don't really like to go into that part of my story. It's, you know, it's a war zone. Um, <clears throat> I did everything that was absolutely necessary for me to support a $200 a day dope habit, heroin habit, taking barbiturates, and I had a sugar daddy who owned one of the largest liquor warehouses in Houston. So I was fixed, y'all. I was fixed. I had hit the big time. Now, what I thought the big time should have been was one of those real pretty wine glasses, drinking you know, some real nice wine, Don Perignon, you know, out of one of these beautiful crystal glasses like we had upstairs tonight. What I winded up drinking out of was something that pretty closely resembled a Bama peanut butter jar. And I was drinking, you know, I had fairly decent liquor, but, you know, that's not the point. All of a sudden, I realized that I had no opportunity to fulfill any of the dreams that I'd always had. I had become exactly what I didn't want to be. I had become exactly what my parents wouldn't let me associate with when I was growing up. I didn't like what I saw. I didn't like what I had become, but I didn't know what to do. I was hopeless and helpless. And um, I, I wouldn't even look at myself in the mirror. I couldn't stand to look at the person that I saw in the mirror. In the process of all of that, I got pregnant again by my son. I was five months pregnant before I found out I was pregnant because it's really hard to tell you're pregnant when you throw up every time you drink or every time you take pills or every time you stick a needle in your arm. You know, when I was pregnant with my daughter, I knew I was pregnant. I wasn't using all of that stuff. 
But at some point in time, I passed that, you know, invisible line. Um, my son was born, and, and uh, I believe that it should be a law. If they can tell me when and where I can smoke, okay, I, I believe it should be a law, a, a law that that movie, The Littlest Junkie, gets shown on TV oh, about every three months. You know, at all times of the day and night. I watched that movie when I was seven months pregnant with that child. I'd been pregnant, I thought, two months. And uh, <clears throat> had steadily lost weight during the pregnancy. I was trying to kick. I was switching chemicals around. That's what I did. When I'd get too strung out, I'd start drinking until I'd pass out. And that's how I'd kick the dope habit. And I'd drink and drink and drink until the drinking got me to the point of blackouts. And then I'd say, i got to get off this shit, you know. And I'd stop drinking by taking Valium and all those other, you know, fine little colored pills that they'll give you at the doctor's office when you look like I did. It was easy to get them. And uh, <clears throat> that's how I went through that deal. Well, I was up late one night, saw that movie, The Littlest Junkie, and I saw for the first time since I started using what my parents had been telling me or what my mother had been telling me, they didn't know we were on what we were on. They knew we were screwing up. Um, I found out and was seen that I was imposing my illness on another human being. You know, up to that point, I'd always believed that it was my right to do whatever I chose to do with my body, and nobody had a right to tell me what I could or could not do to myself. It was my body and my choice. And I realized that there was another human being in there that I was responsible for. And I made the decision to kick that night. And I started kicking. And three days later, three days later, I went into labor. And I delivered that child. And he lived. Uh, that was a miracle all in itself. He was five months old in December. December 1973. Um... Everything fell down on top of me. At some point in time during that six months previous, I had discovered, uh, I knew what I was doing to myself, but I just didn't know how to get out of it. I didn't know how to get out of where I was. And out there on the streets at that point in time, they told you once a junkie, always a junkie. If you're out there on the street, you're going to die on the street. And I believed that because that's what they told me. You know, I... I started a while ago to tell y'all, these young adults that are coming in the program today, I have so much admiration for y'all. I have so much care and love and concern. When I was out there on those streets, whatever we contacted could be taken care of with Ajax or penicillin. What you guys are dealing with today is deadly. It's killing you. You know? We didn't have the issues that y'all have. I have such a hard time understanding those revolving door people that are coming and going out of these doors. Once you walk in today with the issues that y'all have to deal with today that we didn't have to deal with. You know, VD was the worst thing you could get back then. And it's not true today. It's not true. Those chemicals that are out there today, one puff and you can die. You know, one wrong needle and you can die a gruesome death. You know, that's beyond me. It's beyond me. I'm so grateful that I don't have that fear to live with today. It's not hard for me today to fall out of that bed and fall on my knees. I don't know about y'all, but it's not hard for me. I'm grateful that I was restored to sanity. Um... In December 1973, I came to on the 29th of December, and I said, if I, and if I shoot dope today, I'm going to die. If I take Valium today, I'm going to die. If I drink today, I'm going to die. I, didn't, I can't explain to you other than that I truly believe God was doing for me what I could not do for myself, and a spiritual awakening took place in my life without me being aware of it. I woke up with what Bill Wilson describes as a moment of clarity. I knew 
that if I got loaded one more time in any way, shape, or form, one two milligram volume, one small little bitty tiny glass of two point beer, I was going to die. And I didn't want to die. That was the first day in seven years that I haven't wanted to die. Now explain that shit. You know? All of a sudden, I didn't want to die. I woke up and I didn't want to die. And I especially didn't want to die that way. I was willing to die going through it, kicking it, getting off of it, whatever I had to do. I didn't know what to do. I called my mom and dad finally about 1030 in the morning. My mother was a maniac. I, you know, give me the phone, give the phone to daddy, mom. We go round and round on the telephone. She finally gets dad on the phone. I tell dad, you come over here. I got to see you. Daddy comes over to the house. He's got mom with him. She's running around, you know, all hyper. And, um, he sits down on the couch and, um, you know, I mean, this is a gruesome thing. I, I don't know what I do. I hope to God that the program's taught me enough that I wouldn't react this way if one of my kids came to me. What I did was I sat down, you know, and it was like all the lies was were gone. All the bullshit was gone. I didn't know what to say other than to just have diarrhea of the mouth on my parents. You know, and I said, look, I bullshit you and lied to you all my life. I'm a heroin addict, and I've been hooked on alcohol and pot and pills for the last six years, and I don't know what the hell to do, and I don't want to die. And that is verbatim what I told my parents. Well, my mother, y'all can imagine, after the description I've given you, she was jumping around, you know, and screaming and just going wild. And my dad, as long as I live, if I pick up a drink tomorrow, you know, if I go back out there and die, if I get hit by a bus, if whatever, okay, if I die, the earthquake gets me. And believe me, that went through my mind this week several times. <laughs> you know, if if it, if I'm gone, if, it, if my time's up, I will always, always, be grateful to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous for what happened next. And this is the message that I have for you parents, for those of you that are parents. What my father did was in direct opposite of my mother's reaction. He calmly, or probably was in the process of passing out, sat down on the couch, held on to his knees, looked me square in the eye, and calmly said, How long has it been since you were fixed? I said the first honest words I had said to my parents in I don't know how many years. I said, I don't know. He asked me if I was sick. And I said, I don't know, Dad. I don't know if I'm scared to death right now or I'm really sick and starting to go through withdrawals. My dad got up off the couch, went in my kitchen to the telephone, and there was plenty of booze, plenty of pills, plenty of stuff. You know, I mean, I could have been blottoed for days with what was in that house, you know. He went back there. He got on the telephone. He called two or three people in the program. He called his sponsor. He called St. Joseph's Hospital. There wasn't a place in Houston at that time, which is where I sobered up and grew up, there wasn't a place in Houston for people like me at that time. They didn't have treatment centers like they have today. They didn't have the public education that they have today. What they had was psychiatric hospitals where they chain you to the beds, you know. And here I was, his 18-year-old baby girl. He was mortified. He called. He got a hold of Sister Amelia. They offered to take me at their hospital. They had an alcoholism ward, and they told him, Bucky, maybe, maybe this will work. We'll try it. We'll slip her in. They stuck me in the hospital under a, a title called Adult Situational Reaction. That's what it was called back then. I'm a country girl, y'all. I'm taking off my shoes. So anyway, they take me to this hospital, and my, you know, my dad was a used car salesman. He had this great big old Cadillac with these, uh, it's like a '63 Cadillac, one with the big fins on it, you know, and it was gold. And it was a convertible, and it had a muffler missing all down the road, you know. We go into Houston, and it was, I guess, a Sunday morning. I remember the streets being vacant, okay. I don't really know what day of the week it was. I just assumed it was a Sunday morning. And we drove into town, and that old muffler gone down the road, and I could hear it bouncing off the walls. And, oh, I forgot to tell you, in the process of me telling my folks all this, my husband comes home from work, and, of course, I support in his habit, too, and he kind of had to go along with the deal because 
the cards were down and my parents had already called his parents and they took the kids away from us and all that, you know, that bizarre stuff that they do. So they get us down there to this hospital and in my dad, his parents took him and my parents took me and all the way we got that Catholic preaching that you get, you know, and uh, say, I told you if you married that son of a bitch, you know, my mother just really after me. It was all his fault. Her baby girl wouldn't do anything like that. I mean, I was only pregnant when I was 16 years old, but I wouldn't do anything like that. Never understand that. Anyway, they get me down there, and my dad takes me. My dad's my ace in the hole, y'all. I mean, I know how to work my dad. I always have. And I, you know, always did. I knew I knew how to get what I wanted from my daddy. My mother was a bitch. She read me. She read me. She knew when I was lying, and I was a good liar. <laughs> but I could not lie to my mother. i tell her a lie, and she'd look me square in the eye, and she'd say, you're lying. You know? One time in my whole life, I got away with a lie from my mother. I'd been out necking with the guy that I eventually married. And y'all remember those peasant blouses? They had the elastic up in the neck, and you used to slide them down over your shoulder? Well, we'd been out necking and getting drunk, and I came home, and, and uh, I had a 10, 12 o'clock curfew, and uh, I just come running in the door. We were in a hurry. We was all undressed. We was in the back seat, you know, groping. And, um, I come running in the house, and it was one of those nights where I'd had a little bit too much to drink, and I forgot to check everything. You know how you check it all, and you smell your hair, make sure it doesn't smell bad, you know, and you chew some gum. I mean, your parents are busty. I mean, today is tough. My daughter hates me. She can't get away with nothing, you know, nothing. So anyway, I run in the door, and I, my mother's always sat in this eat green easy chair, and she'd sit there, and she had big eyes. And she'd sit there. I swear she really did. Stone, they were bigger, but she did have big eyes. Anyway, she'd sit there, and she'd be like this, waiting for me to come in the door. I come in the door, and she looked at me this one particular night, and I was plenty stoned. And uh, she said, and Denise? And I said, yes, ma'am. And, you know, you don't want to talk because that, <laughs> you see that green fog that comes out of your mouth? <laughs> and when you're stoned, it turns colors, gets stars in it. So anyway, I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, duh. Do you know that that blouse is wrong side out? <laughs> and it was like, I didn't even want to look down. If I don't look at it, it won't be wrong side out, you know? And you got about a split second to think up a good lie real quick. And I knew that I was going to have to do a good job to get out of this one because I was Catholic and it was illegal to look beyond the chin, you know. So anyway, I went, quick check. She's not lying, you know. <laughs> They'll trick you. <laughs> so I looked down, sure enough, it was out on the wrong side out, and I said, oh, my God, Mother, you let me go out like this? <laughs> I swear to God. And you know, you know how... Alcoholic women are so dramatic. We're such good actresses. And then the tears started rolling, and I got really serious. I said, oh, God, Mother, we went. And I told her all about where we went, you know. And I said, and I went in there like this, and I just got away with it. And I walked out to my bedroom. Man, I went. You know, I was fixing to get the beating of my life, you know. And I knew when I pulled that off that I was on easy street. I said, if I can get away with that, I can do that deal, you know. So anyway, I forgot where I was at in my story when I got off onto that. Shouldn't have done that one. At the hospital, thank you. <laughs> hey, y'all, I'm real. <laughs> this thing scares me. So anyway, we get to the hospital, and, you know, I got my daddy right there where I want him. He's feeling really sorry for me. I'm hurting and I'm sick, and he's going to be there for me and make sure I'm okay. And all of a sudden, I turned. And looking me square in the face, and I know everybody tells you this, and it's probably a bunch of lies, but this really did happen. My dad had a brown paper sack in his hands. And in that brown paper sack was a carton of Marlboro 100s and a $5 bill and a pair of pajamas. And he said, baby, and he reached across me. And that was real incredible because my dad, you see, my dad and my mother came from the old school where boys come to the door and they meet your daddy and they shake your hand. they got to have their shirt tucked in and all that. They come and open your doors and close your door, light your cigarettes. Daddy reached over me, 
you know, and it was like everything was vibrating in my head, you know. The fat lady had sung. The curtain was down. And I don't know if any of y'all have ever experienced that, but it was like, this is life and death. This is it. The last person in the whole world that loved me no matter what had told me they were sick of my shit. He reached across, and he flung that door open, and then he looked at me. And I realized that that's the first time since that morning that my father had looked me square in the eyes. And it was like somebody twisted a knife. And he said, baby, you got two choices. You can walk up those seven steps and choose to live. You can take that $5 bill I gave you, go two blocks down the street to your connections house, and you can die. You go up those steps, I'll always be here. You walk them two blocks, and I'm never there again. And it was like, whoa, I'm fucked up now. <laughs> so I go up them steps. I, I didn't want to die, you know, but, I mean, I, all of a sudden I realized just how serious I was, you know, what kind of serious shit I was in. So I go up those stairs, and they interview me, and they stick me off in that hospital, and I did my little time in there, and they put me in that nut house. What time is it? I'm, I can't. Oh, good. I'm not over, y'all. So, anyway, I, you know, they, they put me in lockup. Back then, it was lockup. You know, and they put you in there. They, they didn't segregate everybody. Where You know, y'all have it so easy now, too. You know, not only do you have it hard, but you got it easy, too. they got all these really nice, fancy, schmancy places for you, and everybody's got little matching pajamas. And, you know, <laughs> sometimes they got T-shirts with their name on them and all that, you know, Camp Beverly Hills, you know. <laughs> so, anyway, <coughs> it wasn't like that where I went. What they gave you where I went was, hey, I got two burning now. I'm doing real good. <laughs> They'll send me back there, too. <laughs> so, anyway, I go upstairs. They decide they're going to let me in their hospital. And my poor husband, y'all, he was such a wuss. <laughs> Here he is. Like a little cocker spaniel right behind me, you know. He just followed me where I went. So, anyway... <laughs> Hey, we're great friends today. We divorced. Um, he was a lot of fun to shoot dope with. He wasn't very fun to be sober with. He's lit. He's too serious for me when he got sober. He didn't like me sober. So anyway, um, we get up there, and they put us in lockup because they didn't know what to do with us. They, they were doing experiments on people like us. We were a motley-looking crew, y'all. In 1973, the folks that were coming into Alcoholics Anonymous I'll tell you what an AA meeting was like when I got sober. There was about 12 old guys, and I mean old guys. They got sober at the Lord's Last Supper. <laughs> and there was one table in the room, and they talked about 30 years of liquid insanity. And John Barleycorn. Now, who the hell is John Barleycorn? You know? I I can't, I was probably sober 90 days going to meeting and I was scared, you know how we are, was scared to say, what, what the fuck is John Barricorn, you know? So I thought it was president of AA. I didn't know any better. I went about to tell nobody I didn't know what John Barleycorn was. They might think I was stupid, uh, you know? It never occurred to me that when I came to AA, I had hair that was down to my butt, I weighed 87 pounds soaking wet, and I had drank some mushroom tea about two weeks before I got sober, and we thought it'd be really neat to bleach my hair. And so I let this girl bleach my hair, and at some point in time during this deal, she only bleached one string of hair right here, one clump. I looked like Morticia, you know. But anyway, uh, you know, I went in there, and they put me in that little locked-up ward, and and they gave me my little green paper pajamas, and I don't wear green today. Y'all will never see me in green. I don't like green, and I look like hell in green. And I was green-colored, so I looked really bad. You know, I looked like a lemon walking around in, a, you know, its leaves or something, because I had jaundice. Anyway, they put me in this little lock-up deal, and I was in for the wildest ride. When that book talks about being rocketed into a new dimension... You know, I was several years sober before I ever saw that line, and I thought, shit, they must have been there where I went, you know, because I'm not kidding y'all now. I'm in there. I just thought I was messed up. 
I mean, they put me in this locked up room where all the doors are locked and they lock you up and they take everything away from you. They don't give you nothing you can cut yourself with, hang yourself with, choke yourself with, gag yourself, you know, none of that stuff. If your arms are long enough, they tie them down, you know. <laughs> can you imagine that? Is there anybody in the room that's got, you know, can do that? I, so anyway, they locked me up and I needed to be locked up. And they locked me up. I'm going to share those people with you all real quick. They locked me up with two people that were real significant in my life, Mr. Arnold and Mrs. Asparilla, and these are real people. Mrs. Mrs. Asparilla, she, uh, she, uh, her husband had died in bed with her, and um, she wigged out, you know, and she flipped out, and they put her in this place, and, and uh, so I, she, she'd go to sleep, and she'd jump up, you know, and she'd start screaming, Henry, Henry, are you still alive? And when I, when they put me in, in treatment, you know, addicts, when they're going through withdrawal, they go through the opposite with withdrawal of the chemical that they were on. And since I was on downers, you know, what I did was stayed up for seven days and I couldn't sleep. So I just walked the halls doing that Thorazine shuffle and, you know, just going where I was going and doing, you know, their little stuff they had you doing. And, and anyway, uh, the eighth day I finally got, I thought, man, I'm going to sleep. I was tired for the first time and I laid down, you know. And, she jumped up on top of my chest and pulled me up out of that bed. She said, Henry, Henry, are you alive? And I said, oh, my God, this is it. I'm going to die in this place. These people are stark raving crazy. What have I done to myself? And all during this period of time that I'm in this locked up, locked up, this is locked up, locked up, y'all. They don't even have that anymore. There was Mr. Arnold. Now, Mr. Arnold, I liked Mr. Arnold. He was my bud. Mr. Arnold was a little bit Indian guy. He had green pajamas, too. And um, <clears throat> Mr. Arnold walked around singing that song, They're Coming to Take Me Away, Ha Ha, They're Coming to Take Me Away, Ha. Y'all remember that? Well, that was cool. You know, it was the only entertainment we had in there, so it, it wasn't too bad. And uh, <clears throat> oh, after a little while, you know, it just begins to get on your nerves. You know, I, I mean, I was kicking some serious drugs. And the second day I was in that hospital, I was scared. They put me on methadone. They thought that was the thing to do. And I knew somebody that was hooked on methadone one time, and they weren't very nice people. And I decided I didn't want any methadone because then I'd just leave the hospital with another habit, and I wanted off of that shit, so I didn't take nothing. I cold turkey. I figured that was the place to do it. If I was going to die, I was in a hospital, right? And at least somebody gets get some money. So that's what I did. I cold turkeyed and almost died. And, I, you know, I, I, they had to put me over in the regular hospital for a little while because nothing was working. My kidneys weren't working. My liver was swollen, you know, blood poisoning, malnutrition, you name it. And I had it all except VD. That was the only thing I didn't have. And um, that was a miracle. So anyway, uh, what happened was Mr. Arnold come around this corner one day and he said, they're coming today, you know. And man, when he said that, I said, that's it. That's it. I know it. I'm going off the deep end now. I'm flipping out for sure. So I talked them into letting me out, and they put me out in the regular floor out there, and I just did my deal with those people. And out there I met the maestro, and the maestro was, honest to God, true, true split personality. What the maestro did was, when he'd go into his other personality, he played the piano. And I always loved uh, concert piano music. So this guy, you know, I mean, the, he was he was a real trip, y'all. He was wearing paper green pajamas just like we were, but he didn't know he was wearing paper green pajamas. He thought he was wearing a tuxedo. And, you know, he'd be walking along, and we'd be doing our Thorazine shuffle, and everybody would be in line walking to the cafeteria, the little lunchroom that we had, or going to the nurse's aid station where we get a lot of our cigarettes lit at and that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden, he'd straighten up, his back would get straight, and he'd turn, he'd pivot on his heels, you know, and just get all up there and debonair on us, you know. He'd just start marching that nose be up just at a perfect 45 degree angle and he'd go marching down the hall and we had this piano in the day room that was grossly out of tune and he'd go down there and he'd slide that bench out and he'd sit down on that he'd go flip those tails and then sit down on that piano and shake his head a little bit and get himself right on the bench and then he'd go <laughs> and he'd go to playing and everybody get out of line and just shuffle right on down there to the day room. And we'd sit all around him and listen to him play until the guys came in the little white coats and locked him up and they took him away. And that's what we did there. We did that for 45 days. That was our routine. Well, <clears throat> my husband, the wimp, he got well in treatment. They, he, 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 he wasn't as sick as I was. 
I had to go over to the hospital for a little while, so I was two weeks behind him in their program. So, and he, he, uh, he got to go to an outside AA meeting. And these people came and got him. And he fell in love with this real pretty girl that had been sober about a good hot five minutes, I guess. And he didn't love me no more, and he found out that he never did. That God laid his hands on him at that meeting and healed him from alcoholism. And I was a bag of shit, and them kids were not meant to be. And he left me. Well, he got well about two weeks after we were on open war together and left the hospital. And uh, needless to say, I had a mental breakdown, and I cut my wrist in that hospital. I thought that was the thing to do, I'd get him back, but it didn't. So they threw me back in lockup again, and I met some more real neat people in there. And then they let me come back out ten days later. I spent a long time in that hospital, and I don't really know even long. Close to three months I spent there. And Anyway, he's out running around AA meetings looking real cool. You know, had his hair all cut and slicked up. Boy, he looked good. And uh, I still locked up, and they finally let me go on an outing. And uh, so I'd come home, and, and um, I'd been to a couple AA meetings, and I'd have to sit there in that meeting and look at him and that cute little old girl who had been sober about 10 days now. And, oh, man, it just ripped my guts out. I had a terrible resentment. And that went on for a long time. At any rate, make a long story short, I finally got put back out. I was upstairs, you know, and I, I, I'd had it. I couldn't go through it anymore. Between Mr. Arnold, Miss Asperilla, and the maestro, I was about to go nuts. And uh, I knew if I stayed in that place any longer, I was going to. So I called Carney Mary, who ran a place in Houston called the Turning Point. And uh, I called Carney Mary on the telephone, and I asked her to send somebody up to talk to me. I, I just knew that this that wasn't the deal for me. And Carney Mary sent three people up to talk to me, and the people that she sent up to talk to me were Michael Y., Kathy uh, H., and Larry B. And uh, I don't have enough time to describe those people to you, but, you know, they were real weird. Um, Michael had an afro about this wide, and he was a speed freak, and, you know, when he'd turn his head, that hair would go, you know, he'd be looking for those shadows that he sees, and... Kathy uh, didn't have a bra on, and she had on some sandals they used to call the Jesus Stompers. You know, they were rubber tire tread, and they laced all the way up to your ass. And she had on these hip-hugger jeans and, you know, no bra and a see-through shirt. And Larry had on a dashiki and nothing else. And they're the ones that made the 12-step call on me. And I didn't relate to all those nuts in that hospital, but when them three came to see me, I related to them. They came from the same street that I came from, and they talked about things that I could understand. And so those people took me out to my first AA meeting, and then um, I called Carney Mary a few days later and told Carney Mary I was ready to get out of there, and when she let me come to the turning point, and Carney Mary decided I was just a little bit too cute to come to the to the turning point. She didn't want that kind of trouble because she had a women's house on one side and a man's house on the other. Most of the women in this house were gay. And she didn't want any trouble. So I go to the meetings that I was going to, which we had a group called the Natural High Group and a Live and Kicking Group and the White Trash Group. Those were the young people's meetings. See, by this time, the old-timers, they didn't like these guys that were coming in with hair down to here and, you know, they were real belligerent and they had fought in Vietnam and nobody cared about them and, and they were on some real strange drugs that made them see things in the recesses of their minds that nobody else saw. And they didn't want us in the meeting, so we just made our own meeting. And, and we were doing, scra you know, scraggling along and doing pretty good. And we'd have fireside beach meetings and, you know, just all kinds of bizarre things that they didn't care too much for, candlelight meetings. And, you know, we got to hugging each other and holding hands and holding hands and saying hi to each other. They didn't do any of that in AA when I got there. And uh, my sponsor required that you go to, to the 24-hour club meetings. And, and you know, I have to tell you, Young People's is real, real special to me because I wouldn't be here today if it, if I hadn't have gotten the identification that I got from the Young People's group. But I got the foundation of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous from the 24-Hour Club. Those people, those old-timers that talked about John Barleycorn, and Liquid Insanity, and played dominoes on Friday night, they knew how to work this program. They had the longevity and the stability. They knew how to apply the principles. They knew what the 12 absolutes were in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. They knew what was written between pages 1 and 164 in that book. And uh, what I want to do right now is describe to you what, what it was at my first meeting that hit me. 
Under the lash of alcoholism, we are driven to AA, and there we discover the fatal nature of our situation. Then and only then do we come as o- become as open-minded to conviction and is willing to listen as the dying can be. We stand ready to do anything which will lift the merciless obsession from us, and that's the point that I came to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was beaten and broken. I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't live out there anymore. You people showed me that I didn't have to live that way. I came here to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, 18 years old, with a 10th grade education and two babies. I didn't know how to do anything but steal and prostitute myself in order to make a living. And I couldn't do any of those things sober because y'all told me what I had to do in order to make this program was change my playmates, my play pens, and my play places. And I couldn't do any of those things that I used to be doing. You told me that I had to write down everything in my past that I had done, ugly, bad, nasty, or whatever, to anybody else. Any bad thing that I had done. Any good thing that I had done. I wanted really bad. I wanted sobriety. Um, Just prior to getting out of that hospital, before they let me leave on pass, they allowed me to go to the Lake Whitney Young People's Conference. That's where God lives, y'all. And uh, it's also the AA capital of the world, and I'm required to say that by my sponsor. It is. Uh, there are more people sober in that city per capita than any other city in the United States. Anyway, um, <clears throat> they allowed me to go to that Lake Whitney Young People's Conference, and I thought those people were going out. You know, it looks kind of like y'all hills and mountains. Texas is real flat, but we do have some few little tiny, they're hills to y'all. They're mountains to us. Uh, you know, and, and there's little trails all through them. It's on a real pretty lake, and we got little cabins all around the lake, and that's where we go for our young people's conference. And uh, they let me go to that conference on an outside pass, and I went. And out there, I swear to God, them people were out there smoking dope because they'd come down off this mountain, and they were smiling and laughing, and they looked so happy, and I'd sit there like a buzzard right at the bottom of the path. I wasn't going up that path because I knew that Larry... And Marcy would beat me to death if I went up that path because they told me that there were some people in this program that were losers and there were some people in this program that were winners. And if I stuck with the winners, I'd make it. If I stuck with the losers, I'd go back out in those streets and die, and I didn't want to die. I stuck with the winners. And I knew them people were going up there on that path and smoking dope and coming back down laughing. They glowed. You know, they glowed. Their eyes danced. You know, when I came into the program, you could see to the back of my head. You know, and I, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I was empty. There was nothing there. I was hollow on the inside. Those people had something I wanted. I didn't realize what they had at that time. I didn't know what they were getting on the top of that mountain. And I didn't have sense enough to ask. As I stayed sober in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I later came to understand that where they were going is a place called Serenity Point that we built, our young people's group built. Um, we had the steps cut out in marble and placed up there. And to get to this place, it's on a steep, steep hill, and it's real rocky, and we've never improved that road. It's dangerous going up that hill. Sometimes you're down on all fours getting to the top of there, but if you want to get to that top bad enough, you're willing to get on your knees. I was a long time sober. It was beyond me. Why those people made as much money as they made off that conference while they couldn't fix that street? You know, I'm serious. Several things began to happen in my life. That young people's point was a turning, that young people's conference was a turning point in my life. They introduced me to a group of people that I didn't know existed in the entire world. People that were happy, happy with themselves and happy with what they were doing. Uh, you know, I used to call my sponsor and, and cry, I don't have any kind of an education. It never occurred to me to go back to school. You know, I called him one night in the middle of the night. I said, Larry, I can't get a decent job. I don't have an education. He said, go back to school. God damn it, get a job. You know, so I went back to school and I got an education. Today, as I stand here in front of you, I have two degrees on my wall. Uh, about every two years, I get bummed out, don't like what I'm doing. I go back to school, you know, and I, hey, it works for me. You know, it works for me. So anyway, you know, it introduced me to a whole group of people that I didn't know existed in the whole wide world. Is everybody watching the watches yet? No? Okay. Rolling along. So I wound up in in the eighth year of my sobriety. The one element that I have neglected to tell you people is for the first eight years of my sobriety in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I was active in the program. I went to conferences. I was involved in the International, which is where I met Sweet Harriet. 
and, uh, you know, traveled all over the, the United States with going to different conferences, became involved in that young people's program. The one thing that I did not do and that I had a natural aversion to was that three-letter word, God. I was scared of that person, God. You know, I didn't like that at all. But I met this man named Fletcher J. Fletcher was 25 years sober. Can I have my coffee? Fletcher J., when I met him, was 25 years sober or 20 years sober. And I came, you know, into a meeting, and, and I didn't believe in God. It's not real cool in AA if you don't believe in God. They say it is. But have you ever been in a meeting and somebody say, my name is Ann, and I'm an alcoholic, but I'm an agnostic? I mean, it's just like a dead hush falls over the room, and everybody's going, oh, no, you know. I'm serious, okay, where I got sober. Y'all may not do that here in California. We do that in Texas. We're little... Thank you. So anyway, I didn't believe in God, and Fletcher told me that I didn't have to believe in y'all's God. And he showed me the chapter in the big book that told me that if I really wanted to stay sober, I could stay sober. And that's all I came here for. I didn't come here to get well. I came here to quit drinking. And so I stayed sober. I didn't get nothing else, but I stayed sober. In 1983, I was in a foreign land with some foreign people. I was in Louisiana. I hate that place. <clears throat> got some good people there, but sucks, y'all. You know, I got sober with some real dynamite people, and I just never got used to that place, I guess. At any rate... I hit my bottom in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I truly believe that we all do at some point in time. It's where you hit your, you meet yourself coming and going. You know, all of a sudden, the tools that I built this house, and you know, the book talks about the 12, and 12 talks about building that house on a firm foundation of bedrock. Well, I built my house on bedrock, y'all, but I was using liquid nails. You know, I used only the steps that were necessary in order to keep me sober. None of them that were there to keep me happy. I forgot that word happy. You know, that's real, real important to me today. Anyway, I found myself in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, totally miserable, totally sick, physically just going nuts. My best friend in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, who had been sober eight years, was ecstatically happy, happily married, had a brand new spanking baby, had gone to lunch with her in New Orleans. We had just gone shopping, spent a buttload of money. Harriet and I had gone to New York City and had a ball in New York City, spent a buttload of money in New York City. I mean, you know, I had it made. I was at the pinnacle of everything I'd ever worked for in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. The only thing I didn't have was God, okay? And this girl that was so precious and so dear to me found it necessary to jump out of a window, and kill herself. And I'd had lunch with her two hours earlier. Now, I want you all to know, I did a real serious soul searching when that took place. And I didn't like myself. I came to terms with myself over the next two or three months. And I came to the decision that I wanted to die just like her. You know, I was really tired. I'd worked hard, and that's what it got me. It got me an empty gut. You know, it got me going to bed at night with me. You know, with me. I couldn't get away from me. Couldn't get away from that ugly person that was behind the makeup, behind the jewelry, behind the clothes, behind the Cadillac, you know. I was still in bed with me. Well, I made that decision that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to die by God. I was tired of doing your deal. Your deal didn't work. I stayed sober, yeah, but it was just the same as it always was. I just didn't have the chemical. I was still sorry, son of a bitch, you know. And I made that decision that I wanted to die, and I was really sick with bronchitis, and I walked outside, and, and I took all my clothes off, and we were having a little bit of an ice storm, and I laid down underneath a pecan tree with a raging fever and thought for sure that I was going to die because I chose to die. I made that decision. Well, I woke up about four hours later, sicker than I was before I laid down underneath that, that tree, and that second moment of clarity hit me. And what that moment of clarity was, is, by God, I better do the best I know how to do and get some happiness out of this program because I don't have any damn decisions in this in this deal. I don't make any decisions. God makes those decisions. If I choose to blow my head off, what will happen is my juggler brain will stay unless God's ready to take me. So all I'm doing in this world, if I'm making myself miserable, is making myself miserable. I've got to stay here until he's ready to take me. So by God, I better get happy. I better find something that's going to make me happy. And that's what I did. 
I wasn't real sure about that deal, and I got down on my knees, and I started praying to whatever that is up there, you know, and I'd say, okay, I'm here, and I'm praying, and they tell me you're there, and if you're there, okay, you know, and, but I'm going, I'm willing, I'm going to do your will today, and when I have all those nasty bad thoughts, I'm not going to cuss, and I'm not going to say bad words to that girl, I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do, you know, and that's the way I started, but I started with a minimal amount of faith. You know, and from a minimal amount of faith, I got to the point in my life where I believe that there's absolutely nothing in this world that I cannot achieve as long as I keep God first. Sorry, y'all. So in 1983... I'd finally come to terms with a power greater than myself and had begun to climb up that that hill, you know. I got part of the way up that hill in the program without God, but that's as far as I got. And the steeper that hill got, the harder it got to climb, you know. I was down in them rocks. My knees were bleeding. My knuckles were bleeding, you know. Well, I stood up and dusted myself off and started trucking up that hill. In January of 1983, of 1984, the best friend in my whole, whole life died, and that was my dad. Two days before my 10th birthday, 90 days after my dad died, my mom died. 60 days after my mom died, my brother died. And in August, my sponsor died. But you know what? I made it. I didn't die, and I didn't want to die. I didn't do drugs. I didn't drink. I kept coming back. I stayed until the miracle took place. You see, my miracle didn't take place that first ten years I was sober. My miracle didn't take place till the end of that year. On December the 12th, 1984, when I felt like a scab on your knee that you just keep knocking the scab off of. You know, I was down on my knees and I said, God, I really know that you love me. And I really know that you want the best for me. And I really believe that you're going to take care of me. And I really believe that if I ask you to pick up this cross and help me carry it, it won't be too heavy. And I can make it up that hill. And I made it up that hill, and that morning when I read my meditation book, the little line at the top of my book said, Pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. And I decided right then and there that I wanted to be happy, and that I deserved to be happy. I've worked real hard for everything that I've ever had, drunk, sober, or in between. And I really wanted that. I had two kids that are fixing to graduate from high school now, and my son tells me a couple of weeks ago that he wants to be a doctor. He wants to go to medical school. I didn't get here the easy way, and I didn't stay sober the easy way, but I stayed sober. And I wanted to live. And I had to make a decision in this program to be happy as well as to be sober. See, staying sober isn't something you just do. There's a lot of action behind staying sober. You make a decision that no matter what happens in your life, no matter if your mom dies, no matter if your dad dies, no matter if they all die on you, you know, you're going to stay sober and you keep on trucking and one day God will show you what it is that you're supposed to learn I got my freedom you know I got my freedom from bondage of self when all those people left me suddenly there was nobody there suddenly I had to put to work the tools that Alcoholics Anonymous gave me 
Suddenly, I had to start walking what I'd been talking for a long time. It's time for me to wind up. And I want to, I want to read something to y'all that became real, real special to me. Uh, during this time, this is from the Velveteen Rabbit. See if I can do this. Shit, I need my glasses. <laughs> Real isn't how you're made, said the skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a, a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. Does it hurt, asked the rabbit. Sometimes, said the skin horse, for he was always truthful. When you're real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up, he asked, or little by little? It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easy or have sharp edges or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you're real, most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all because once you're real, you can't be ugly except to people who don't understand. But once you're real, you can't become unreal again. It lasts for always. And this is for my children. Ever hopeful, filled with dreams, bright and new, brand new, hopeful schemes, pastel shades, and Wedgwood, Wedgwood skies, first light of loving in your eyes, soon too dim, and then you flee, leaving me alone with me. The things I fear, the things you said, burning rivers in my head, bereft of all we shared, my soul so old, so young, so bare, afraid of you, of me, of life, of men. Until the bright new dreams begin again. The landscape never quite the same. Eventually, a different game. Aware at last of what I know. I think and am and feel. The gift of love. At long last, I'm real. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.